Good morning and welcome to the 10 o'clock service here in First Presbyterian Church in San Anselmo. It's Trinity Sunday and it also is Memorial Day weekend. I am Maureen Kalbus and in my capacity as elder with responsibility for worship, I'm leading today, stepping in for our pastor, Scott Clark, who is on vacation. I'm not alone. <laughs> we have our guest preacher, whom we know very well. Uh, Nick Morris is a member of our church and also a serving uh, elder. Currently, he serves as executive director of the Marin Street Chaplaincy. He has a BA from Duke University, a Master of Divinity from San Francisco Theological Seminary. Formerly, he was a multicultural minister at Good News Presbyterian Church in uh, San Rafael, sorry, in San Francisco. He's passionate about building beloved community and fostering an environment of care where everyone has a seat at the table. This is the day that God has made. Let us be glad. Let's worship God. And I invite Alice to lead us in the liturgy. As we gather in the body of the risen Christ, please join me in the call to worship. Creator of the world, eternal God, Redeemer of humanity, God with us. Spirit of unity, go between God. So here, in this space, let us take time together for where paths cross, and pilgrims gather, there is much to share and celebrate. Please join in singing the opening hymn, number 14, For the Beauty of the Earth, verses one through four.
Please join me in prayer as we confess our need for God. God of grace, your mercy and love are from everlasting to everlasting. We confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive us, change us, open us to what you have created us to be so that we might delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please join me as we affirm God's abounding grace. We lean into the grace and love of a God of second chances and boundless mercy, a God who calls us each by name. The love of God is beyond measure, and you are included in that love. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven, loved, and set free. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Amen. Now we come to the time where we greet each other, and I ask Carl to put the spotlight on the congregation so that they can wave to the people on Zoom. And the people on Zoom can relate to each other via chat. We're glad to have them with us and people see people right up and down the coast and across America. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. So. I hear you, Paul, and that's a joy. Thank you, good. Yes, I think we can hear Nick. I'm trying to figure out where the mic is. It's Nick, yeah. I need to know how it was, and I'm sure. I can't. There we go. Who are you meeting with? Can't find the right camera. Mute. Um. Oh, he's gone now. Maybe Carl. Okay. Okay. No, he's back. All right. I hope he doesn't say anything embarrassing or something. He's like playing whack a mole. Okay. Yeah, really, I know. Well, that's a I, I don't. I can't. It's not that's lighting up words. when someone's talking, so I can't figure out which one it is. Oh, that's interesting. That's usually the way we figure it out, right? Yeah, I know, right? Let <laughs> uh, me just try turning off all the. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, it's not. All different. right. Well. Ah, I think Nick's on the phone. That's what it is. But he doesn't. I don't see a. Anyway, um, you have to talk over the. You have to talk over the distraction. Good morning, Ben. I see you with your new window. Anders, Cece, Paula, Sheha, Shihu, Shira. Phoebe, Quentin, Hannah, Olivia, L, Ashley, and those on Zoom. And we welcome the Reverend Grace Kim. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can I sit over there? You can sit, and I can sit next to you. Yes, thank you. So are you going to go to school tomorrow? Why? Memorial Day. So what is the meaning of a Memorial Day? Oh, yes. Perfect. Great. <laughs> so Memorial Day is a day to honor, celebrate, and remember the brave soldiers who died while protecting our 
country. Yes, so tomorrow is a day to remember. Then also we can remember Jesus because Jesus died and resurrected to protect and then save us from the sin and Jesus gave us a new life. Yes? Amen. So today, so I want to ask a congregation that and I want to show you what our children have learned at the class. Cool? Great? Yes. So we have been talking about the life of Jesus so far at the class. So I, I will ask questions to them and they will answer if they can remember. Good? Okay. So let's stand up. So there is a rule. So if you, if you listen the question and then raise your hand and call your name first and then I give a mic and you can answer. Yes? Yes? Okay. So how many disciples, Jesus' disciples, at the, at the time, at the time, not today, at the time. Rule is, raise your hand, call your name first. Yes. Shira, and I can mic. Uh, 12. 12, yes, this is a, this is a pretext. Okay? <laughs> okay, I give you a question, and if you listen, and if you know, if you remember, raise your hand. Call your name, Shiha or Shi, um, Shine. Oh, okay. And Anderson, Everett, and I give a mic, and you can answer. Yes? Okay. Are you ready? Are you ready? Okay. What was the name of the first disciple Jesus called? Raise your hands and name first. Your name. Yes, your name. No, no, your name. Call your name first. Everett and Peter. Yes, yes. Andrew and his brother Simon, but Jesus gave Simon the new name, Peter. Yes. And what, were, uh, what are their jobs? Um, um, to help Jesus. Yes, but what are their jobs first? They have many jobs, but first job, first job, yes, first job, what are their first job? How to tell people about Jesus. Okay, what are their first job? Oh, <laughs> uh, Fishermen. Fishermen, yes. Who walk on the water? Call your name. Jesus. Yes, right. And what did the disciples say when they saw Jesus walk on the water? Call your name. It's a ghost. It's a ghost, yes. Who said you wanted to walk on the water? Call your name. Shira. Shira. Um, Peter. Peter, yes. When Peter sink into the water, Jesus hold Peter's hand, and what did Jesus say to him? She who? Don't be afraid, uh, don't be afraid for Christ is with you. Yes, don't be afraid, I'll be with you. Yes, we did egg hunt, yes? What day was that? Easter. Easter. Okay, what is the meaning of Easter? Raise your hand. Jesus dying. Jesus died and? He rose. Yes, right. So Easter is to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ and remember Christ's love. Okay, we have uh, four more. So when is Pentecost? Um, Pentecost is the 50 days after Easter. Yes, 50 days after Jesus. Do you know that? Yes. 
Okay, what is the meaning of Pentecost? Wow, what is the Pentecost meaning? What is the meaning of Pentecost? So remember that and we made uh, three hands. Yes? Um, it's, um, oh. it's about um, 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 when, God, when Jesus into three people. Three people into one. <laughs> yes? Call your name first. God. Call your name first. Jesus. God, Jesus, and something else Holy come back. <laughs> and Holy Spirit. <laughs> yes, yeah, so something else is the Holy Spirit. Yes, we do celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. Okay, what do Christians believe? Oh, you can answer, Gina. <laughs> what do Christians believe? <laughs> Very general, very huge answers, I know. But you can remember that in the last week. Yes? Um, Christians believe in Jesus. Jesus. God and the Holy Spirit. The three persons in one, yes. What did Jesus taught us who believe in God? What did Jesus Teach us who believe in God. To, yes? To, God to love your neighbor. Love your God and love your neighbor. They are so awesome, right? Yeah, clap for them. Yes, yes. So um, it is a blessing that and the kids grow up with faith and God's love. So tomorrow is a day to celebrate and remember those who protected us. Also, as a Christian, we remember God's love today, tomorrow, and always. And also, we remember that Jesus taught us love your God and love your neighbor. Amen. So who want to lead the preacher prayer? Uh, okay, uh, God, I love you. God, I love you. Help, me Help me to love others as you love me. Amen. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is Mark 2, verses 13 through 15. Jesus went out again beside the lake. The whole crowd gathered around him, and he taught them. As he was walking along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at table in Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were also sitting with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners?
scripture reading this morning is Luke 7 verses 1 through 10. After Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave whom he valued highly and who was ill and close to death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him asking him to come and heal his slave. When they came to Jesus, they appealed to him earnestly, saying, He is worthy of having you do this for him, for he loves our people, and it is he who built our synagogue for us. And Jesus went with them. But when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him to say, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but only speak the word and let my servant be healed. For I also am a man set under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another come, and he comes. And to my slave, I say, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in perfect health. We celebrate the written word of scripture. Thanks be to God. We celebrate the living word, Christ among us. Thanks be to God. It will not be over until we talk. It will not be over until we talk. These are the words on a bumper sticker that is stuck to the front of Rami's motorbike. Rami Elhanan is an Israeli whose 13-year-old daughter Smadar was killed by Palestinian suicide bombers. He is friends with Bassam Aramin, a Palestinian whose 10-year-old daughter, Abir, was killed by a rubber bullet 
shot by an Israeli soldier. This morning, I will share two stories. My story of leaving the United States for the first time to live and work in Jordan with a group of Jordanians, Palestinians, and a smattering of others from around the world, and in how it helped me to grow and see myself and these so-called others through a new lens. While the main story is about Rami and Bassam as depicted in the book A Paragon by Kellum McCain, the book weaves fiction with the real life stories of the tragic loss of two daughters, one Israeli and the other Palestinian, and how their fathers came together through the parents' circle, a support group for both Palestinians and Israelis who have lost children in the conflict. Both men travel around the world together to share their stories, to put an end to the senseless violence and promote peace in their disputed homeland. This masterfully written book opened my mind to the complexities of the conflict and opened my heart to the shared suffering on both sides of this tragic divide. It gives me hope at this time when hope is hard to come by. Their stories of courage reminded me of the example Jesus said in our scripture readings by reaching out to the so-called others, the tax collectors and sinners in Mark 2, and by Jesus' openness to receive the centurion in Luke 7. He set the stage for the parents' circle by bridging the cultural and tribal divide. And that was really radical for the time, right? The early Christian movement and the Christian way did so much to bring people together to expand the circle, to create more seats at the table. It's also a radical act in this time where there's so much division to make an effort to connect with the other, whether it is talking with someone you disagree with politically or breaking bread with those who are homeless. If you're wondering about the title of the book as I was, a paragon is from the ancient Greek for a polygon with an infinite number of sides. A good title for a book that challenges us to think about the, the nuances of the Israeli Palestine conflict, its contradictions, its ironies, and its pain, such a complex issue with many sides. I was so moved by this book, I, I stayed up all night reading. It, um, it really changed my heart and my mind. I want to read to you uh, an expert from um, Rami from his testimony about his first visit to the parents' circle after the visit, after the death of his daughter. He was invited by an Orthodox Jew who started the group after the loss of his child. At first, Rami thought this man was crazy. Rami had served in the Israeli army during his compulsory service, and he says he may have killed Palestinians from a distance like in a video game. There was no way that he was going to join this group. He resisted until he couldn't resist any longer. Rami says, to be bereaved in Israel is to be part of a tradition, something really terrible, but holy at the same time. And I never thought that one day I would be one of them. On and on they came, so many of them. But then I saw something else, something completely new to me. To my eyes, my mind, my heart, my brain. I was standing there and I saw a few Palestinians passing by in a bus. Listen, this flabbergasted me. I knew it was going to happen, but still I had to do a double take. Arabs, really? 
going into the same meeting as these Israelis? How could that be? A thinking, feeling, breathing Palestinian. And I remember seeing this lady in black, traditional Palestinian dress, with a headscarf, you know, the sort of woman who I might have thought could be the mother of one of the bombers who took my child. She was slow and elegant, stepping down from the bus, walking in my direction. And then I saw it. She had a picture of her daughter clutched to her chest. She walked past me. I couldn't move. And this was like an earthquake inside me. This woman had lost her child. It maybe sounds simple, but it was not. I had been in a sort of coffin. This lifted the lid from my eyes. My grief and her grief, the same grief. I went inside to meet these people, and here they were, and they were shaking my hand, hugging me, crying with me. I was so deeply touched, so deeply moved. It was like a hammer on my head cracking me open. An organization of the bereaved, Israeli and Palestinian, Jew and Christian, Muslim, atheist, you name it, together in one room, sharing their sorrow, not using it, celebrating, celebrating it, but sharing it, saying that if this is not a degree, decree of faith, that we should live forever with a sword in our hands. I cannot tell you what sort of madness it seemed. You see, I was 47, 48 years old at that time, and I had to learn to admit it was the first time in my life to that point, I can say this now, I could never even think of it then, it was the first time that I had met Palestinians as human beings. Not just workers in the street, not just characters in the newspaper, not just transparencies, terrorist objects, but how do I say this? Human beings. Human beings. I can't believe I'm saying that. It sounds so wrong, but it is a revelation. Yes, who, human beings who carry the same burden that I carry. People who suffer exactly as I suffer. An equality of pain. And like the psalm says, we are running from our pain to our pain. I'm not a religious person, far from it. I have no way of explaining what happened to me back then. If you had told me years ago that I would say this, I would have said, you were crazy. He goes on to say, you never heal. Don't let anyone tell you that you ever fully heal. It's the living who have to bury the dead. I pay the price. Sometimes I despair, but what else is there to be in the end but hopeful? What else are we going to do? Walk away? Kill ourselves? Kill each other? That's already happened. It didn't achieve much. I know that it will not be over until we talk to each other. That's what it says on the sticker on the front of my bike. Joining with others saved my life. We cannot imagine the harm we're doing by not listening to one another, and I mean this on every level. It is immeasurable. We may have built up our wall, but the wall is really in our minds, and every day I try to put a crack in it. Mm. Then there was Bassam, who grew up in a cave in Palestine. He lost his home due to the occupation. He threw rocks at the Israeli soldiers, and one day in 1985, the same year I was living across the Jordan River, he and his friends found some old grenades and threw them at some, old, some soldiers, and they fizzled. They didn't even blow up. He spent the next seven years in an Israeli prison. While he was in prison, he saw a, docu a documentary about the Holocaust. And while he had been a Holocaust denier and he hated Jews, it changed something in him. After being released, he got married, became a father, and with some Israelis started a group called Combatants for Peace. Bassam says Rumi, the poet, the Sufi, said something that I will never forget. 
Beyond right and wrong, there is a field. I'll meet you there. We were right and we were wrong and we met in a field. We realized that we wanted to kill each other to achieve the same thing, peace and security. Imagine that, what an irony. It's crazy. We sat in the Everest Hotel and talked about ending the occupation. Even that word occupation makes most Israelis tremble. Of course, each one, of course, each one had a different point of view. They are the occupiers and we are the ones under occupation, so it looks different to them. But in the end, we were all dying. We were all killing each other over and over and over. We needed to know each other instead. This is the center of gravity. This is where it all comes down. There will be security for everyone when, ev when we have justice for everyone. As I've always said, it's a disaster to discover the humanity of your enemy, his nobility, because then he is not your enemy anymore. He just can't be. Bassam goes on to say, in Palestine we say ignorance is a terrible acquaintance. We do not talk to the Israelis. We are not allowed to talk to them. The Palestinians don't want it and the, and the Israelis don't want it. We have no clue what the other one is like. That's where the madness lies. Put up a wall, put up a checkpoint, write the Nakba out of the books, do what you want. But here's the key. We are not voiceless, no matter how much silence there is. We need to learn how to share this land, otherwise we will be sharing it in our graves. Bassam learned to speak Hebrew while he was in jail, and then he went and earned a master's degree in England. His dissertation was on the tragedy of the Holocaust. When Bassam was jailed in 1985, I was a freshman at Duke University thinking of majoring in poli-sci. I, I attended a speech by Queen Noor al Hussein, wife of King Hussein of Jordan. She, poke, she spoke about a program coordinated by the Jordanian U, and U.S. governments that would select, select a diverse group of 16 American students from out, throughout the United States to live and work in Jordan. I heard it was the first official cultural exchange between the United States and an Arab country. I applied and was accepted to leave that summer. I was 20 years old and my first time traveling outside the country. 16 of us split into two groups of eight from different backgrounds, races, and religious affiliations. I had to convince my father to sign a government waiver of liability that included paying for the transport of my body back home, including the body bag in which I would be transported. He had, he had not, my father had never traveled outside the, the United States and couldn't understand why I would leave the greatest country in the world and go to a place others wanted to flee. I couldn't explain that. I had a burning desire to learn about another people and culture. I ended up telling my mother it was a permission slip <laughs> and, and then uh, I told her not to bother to read it and just sign it. We met at a university, the group. We met at a university and went through cultural sensitivity training. Don't cross your legs for fear of showing the soles of your shoes. That's disrespectful. Be careful not to admire pictures, knickknacks, or anything for that matter, as the Arabs are so generous that it will be going home with you. And believe me, that is true. Keep your arms and legs covered, and men and women, please don't touch. And when you meet the queen, do not hold out your hand. Let her make the first gesture. The plan was to work on two different archaeological digs. We were told that we were high-profile targets and that if anyone asked, we should tell them we were archaeology students. The digs were our reason for being there, our cover story. We would fly from, to, from New York to Paris to Amman, via Damascus. On the Air France flight from Paris, I nervously read an English version of Time magazine. The cover showed a hijacked plane in Athens with the title, Americans Out of the Middle East. It was the summer of hijacking and hostages. During the layover in Syria, tanks would surround our plane, 
armed soldiers with Kalashnikovs would enter our Air France flight to check passports. We were not in Kansas anymore. When we arrived in Amman, I felt like I had landed in another world with the sights, sounds, smells, and especially the Muslim call to prayer as the sun set. So beautiful. After two nights in Amman, we headed to a compound in Yarmouk near the Syrian border where we would spend most of our time living, working, sharing, and breaking bread with Jordanians, Palestinians, and a group from Germany. Up until that point in my life, I had not known anyone from Jordan or Palestine. At boarding school, I had two classmates from Saudi Arabia, but this was different. This was the other, a foreigner in a country and with a people that were foreign to me. What I learned is that the people I met were, for the most part, just like my friends in the U.S. Most wanted a good life, to have a good job, raise a family, and live in peace. Growing up, as a young boy, I watched cartoons that depicted Arabs as dirty, wild-eyed, weapon-toting terrorists. That was not the case. Each person I met reminded me of someone I knew at home, the computer nerd, the intellectual, the sports fanatic, and the devoted father and or mother. We met Queen Noor at the Palace in Amman and went to the American Embassy to meet the ambassador and his family at a cocktail party that was hosted for us. There was heavy security everywhere we went. I befriended a young Palestinian named Faraz. He invited me to his one-room apartment and offered me snacks and tea. On the wall was a picture of Yasser Arafat and a Palestinian flag. He showed me a map of the region where there was no Israel. I thought that was odd. He then shared that when he traveled to visit his family in the West Bank, he and the other young men were often forced to strip naked at that first checkpoint, to crouch in a circle with their clothes thrown in a pile, even in the cold and rain for hours, sometimes overnight, before allowing them to be on their way to visit their families. He was very angry. I also joined a Time magazine photographer that was staying in our compound to go on an expedition to document conditions in a Palestinian refugee camp in Jordan. We climbed over a wall and snuck into the camp. Neither of us knew much Arabic. There was sewage in the streets and terrible living conditions. I took notes while he took pictures. I was young and reckless. I had many talks with the people in our house, Jordanians, Palestinians, and the group from Germany that ran the archaeological dig. They all shared with me that Americans didn't have a good reputation in their countries and said that we were naive. By living in Jordan, I realized that we live on a big island here in the United States that's protected on all sides. We have space to be naive. Not so in the Middle East. We should be grateful. Before leaving Yarmouk for Amman to catch a flight back to the States, I was arrested for taking a picture while picking up some souvenirs in town. I was taken to a police station, interrogated and released. I heard somebody being beaten in another room. Maybe they thought I was an Israeli spy, but it was a civic lesson. It was a civics lesson I will never forget. It will not be the end, it will not be over until we talk to each other. What will not be over? Think about that. What is it that will not be over until we talk? For me, the obvious answers are war, violence, injustice, bigotry, hatred, brutality, intolerance, and their offspring, homophobia, homeless phobia, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, and even the decimation of the ecosystem that sustains our lives. There are more, but you get the point. Thankfully, there are examples throughout Scripture and in the life of Jesus and in modern-day movements like the Parent Circle and the story of Rami and Bassam that give us hope that it can be done. We may not agree with each other, but we need to talk to each other like Jesus did with the so-called others. Rami and Bassam did it. The 19-year-old me did it. You can do it. We all need to talk to each other to give healing and a chance 
in a world that seems irreparably broken. Amen. Well, thank you, Nick. That was fascinating and really brought the whole situation here among us. We now are going to enter a time of prayer. We initially will be singing a prayer hymn, then we'll have some silence, and then spoken prayer. So if you'd like to join in the prayer hymn number 851, come bring your burdens to God, and we'll sing it twice. Gracious God, you created all that is in love, created us to live life in loving and just relationship with each other and with all creation. You are always with us, moving us towards reconciliation and peace. We trust the concerns of our hearts to you. And in community with all who have ever called on you, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Welcome particularly any visitors who have joined us. And we urge you to seek out the little uh, yellow card in the pew in front of you and fill it in, and then put it in the offering basket. Somebody then from our church will make contact with you. If you're on Zoom, you can make yourselves known through chat. But we do love connecting. And I invite now Joy Snyder via Zoom to tell us about something that's coming up in which the women of the church may connect. <laughs> Good morning and thank you, Maureen. This morning's Minute for Mission pertains to the upcoming women's gathering to be held on Saturday, June 15th at 9.30 a.m. here in the Fireside Room, as well as on Zoom. This group was started because the women in our congregation, as well as some friends and family members, were no longer in contact regularly every weekend as they were prior, prior to COVID. So Mary Catherine and I were talking about this one day and we realized that we surely weren't the only ones who felt the loss of that connection. We decided it was time for an experimental solution and thus the women's extended coffee hour was born. Now this one coming up marks our fourth quarterly gathering, thus completing a one year cycle, making it our first anniversary, right? 
That being said, <laughs> thank you, Vivian. That being said, Carl, if you would, please cue the slides. As you can see from these slides, there are a lot of familiar faces, either being reminded right now of how much fun they had and they are waiting for you to join them at this next gathering. It's easy to register and we really hope you will. Just go to the church website, say it with me now, www.togetherweserve.org and click on the events tab. There you will see our icon to reconnect, restore, rejoice, and recycle. Click on that to let us know you're coming and let me know if you're willing to contribute to the snackery table. It's become known, known for yummy and sometimes even healthy snacks to accompany the free coffee, tea, and juice that being provided. The number of attendees has continued to hold steady all year averaging a little over 40 women between the Zoom room and the fireside room. The most important thing that happens at these gatherings for sure is communication. That, and if you'll pardon the pun, the joy. Okay, maybe I should just say the rejoicing. But either way, oh, before I forget, we added a feature to our last gathering that was a big hit. It was sort of a side hustle. We think it's appropriate to call it the free for all. It will be held in the Memorial Garden and it's kind of like a yard sale, but with no money exchanged, free. In other words, if you're involved in spring cleaning or if you're more seriously involved in not doing spring cleaning, maybe we can help you out by inviting you to bring along anything that's in good condition, but maybe has worn out its welcome at your house. Bring it on in and see if somebody else might like to adopt it. Oh, and let me add just one more thing. I've heard that we may have a surprise guest on the Zoomers team. You remember Libby Davis? Sure would be nice to see her again, right? I'm just saying. I hope to see you there for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. And now Nick is going to give us a brief word. There you go. I miss you, Joy. <laughs> you too, Nick. Back at you. Oh, I just wanted to make an announcement um, that next week, after worship, if anyone is interested in walking around the property and trying to figure out where we could put bike racks, I don't think anybody can argue with bike racks. They've been a long time coming, and... The Connections group is going to try to make this happen. So if you want some input for that, meet us outside the sanctuary after church next Sunday, and we'll start the process. Thank you. Thank you. Well, apart from getting together and connecting on Sundays, there are many opportunities throughout the week for us to connect. We get together to pray and gather the Transition Support Group, they meet on Wednesdays via Zoom at 9 o'clock. The Prayer and Connection Group, Thursdays via Zoom, 3 o'clock. Centering Prayer, Thursdays at 9.30, that's in Memorial Garden. The Exercise Group, Monday and Thursday, 9.30 in Duncan Hall. And the Book Group, Mondays via Zoom at 3 o'clock. And then, in relation to serving, we can join the anti-racism team or the church and society team. We can help stock the community fridge outside Duncan Hall. We can partner with the work of MOC and MIC. We can donate to the Canal Alliance's support of new babies and mums. We can also get together and share we share our offerings and pledges through the website at togetherweserve.org, give online, or by mail, sending it into the church office. And friends, every Sunday in worship, we give thanks to God with our morning offering. We offer back to God some of the resources God has entrusted to our care. 
knowing that we can do more together than we can ever do on our own. And I invite Alice now to tell us about sensibility. Good morning again. Uh, today is a fourth Sunday, and that means it's Sensibility Sunday. Uh, I think you all know the general idea uh, about sensibility. It is the way that we attempt to deal with the hunger and food insecurity issues that exist uh, in, in this neighborhood, uh, in this presbytery, nationally and internationally. Uh, the money that we collect uh, and put in that basket down there uh, goes to fund all sorts of good things and uh, wearing a different hat, uh, Nick Morris, who is the uh, executive director of the Marin uh, Street Chaplaincy, uh, also is, is supported by an annual, uh, an annual gift from, that is from the Sensibility Fund. And our community fridge, which uh, Maureen just mentioned, uh, began with a grant from the Sensibility offering. Uh, there is lots for us to do. It's easy to give. You can put money in the basket here. Uh, you can send a check to the church. And probably the easiest way of all uh, is to go online and give that way on the, on the church's website. It's very easy to do. If you do send a check to the church, please be sure to put sensibility in the memo line. And it doesn't matter how you spell it. Uh, we'll figure it out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alice. And as we share in our morning offering, we up, offer up our prayers of gratitude. Thinking back on your week and in this moment, what's one thing for which you can be grateful? And as we lift up our prayers of gratitude, we will now receive the morning offering.
Beautiful. I'm always grateful for the music in our services, Natsuko, and the choir. Thank you. Please join in the closing hymn number 373, O Day of Peace. Now go forward with the love of Christ in your hearts and where there is ever separateness, let there be togetherness. Follow the example of Jesus and Rami and Bassam and talk to each other. Lead the way like Jesus leaded the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>